Drug companies are anxious to get their products onto the market as soon as possible. This is, after all, a business, and every day can be worth millions. To assure the public and mainstream physicians that their little-tested psychotropics are safe, drug companies spare no expense in getting psychiatrists to stand behind them, and psychiatrists are happy to take the money. It's really quite an interesting marriage that the drug companies have with the medical profession and, and psychiatry primarily is a strong arm of, of them. This relationship is born in medical school. You go to medical school and you learn that drugs are the answer. And then you go into residency and you, you're told about this whole armamentarium of psychotropic drugs. And if somebody's bipolar, you use this whole group of drugs. If someone's depressed, you use these drugs and so on. And that is the Bible. And when you're a believer, as psychiatrists are in the Bible of psychiatry or in that box called psychiatry, um, you're not likely to stray unless you begin to think for yourself. And once out of medical school, many of these true believing psychiatrists are recruited by drug companies and groomed to be spokesmen. They know then who are the psychiatrists who are most easily influenced and they can then invest in those doctors, take those doctors to um, whatever fancy resort to be educated about the latest newest med and those people then become the experts they go and give the talks at the medical dinners at the fancy restaurants or at the drug sponsored symposia at uh, the american psychiatric association um, they become the teachers in the residency training programs once these so-called key opinion leaders have canvassed the psychiatrists in their area they then bridge over to mainstream physicians to convince them to prescribe psychotropic drugs. So you have the psychiatrist coming in now and teaching at an OBGYN convention where they'll give papers there or they'll do, you know, design to address um, GPs and teach the GPs how to look for and diagnose these diseases and these illnesses. And again, the psychiatrist is, they're the ones who are gonna know, like in the medical profession, most of the doctors will say, well, these guys are the specialists in the field. I'm going to listen to how they want me to do this so that I can do it in my own practice, and they'll follow that lead and that influence, all funded by the drug companies. Indoctrinating physicians begins at medical conferences like these, where government-mandated continuing medical education, or CME, courses are taught. I'm required once a year to have so many units of postgraduate training and so I have to go to get my hours by uh, approved training centers that the state uh, recognizes and those approved training centers are run by the drug companies. But far from being educational, these conferences are frequently produced by professional medical education firms hired by drug companies and their psychotropic drug seminars are commonly conducted by drug company paid psychiatrists who can be paid up to $2,500 for a single lecture. Most of the continuing, continual medical uh, education co conferences and courses are sponsored by pharmaceutical companies and so uh, I can guarantee you they're not going to have doctors talking about the risks of using their medications. The purpose of these conferences is clear. As one of the medical education company's marketing materials reads, Whatever combination of audiences you need to motivate in order to exert maximum leverage on the marketplace, we can help you identify them, reach them, and influence their behavior. As a marketing strategy, CME works. In one study, prescription rates of doctors following medical education conferences went up 87% for one drug and 272% for another. Not surprisingly, the pharmaceutical industry now spends up to $1 billion for 371,000 such events every year. And as long as they're making money, they're going to do everything they can to subsidize medical education, medical journals, postgraduate medical education, including the educating of psychiatrists, to use as many drugs as possible. And the psychiatrists paid to give these talks make out very well. Case in point, Dr. Charles Nemiroff of Emory University. With deep financial ties to nearly two dozen different drug companies, Dr. Nemiroff received $2.8 million in pharmaceutical money from 2000 to 2007. 
when it was revealed that he had violated federal law by failing to report $1.2 million of this money to his university, he stepped down as chairman of Emory's psychiatry department. But Dr. Nemiroff did not stop at speeches and personal appearances. He was also exposed for having financial ties to a company whose medical device he reviewed favorably in a psychiatric journal he himself edited. On another occasion, he hired 14 Emory University colleagues to write articles for a special supplement of the medical journal celebrating the fifth anniversary of the introduction of the antidepressant Effexor. Nemiroff's journal is one example of a very large problem. In one notable case, the New England Journal of Medicine printed an article whose authors had so many financial ties to drug companies that because of space limitations, the journal was forced to list them on its website. Printed out, these financial conflicts covered three single-spaced typewritten pages. But it goes further. In many instances, respectable journals have been fooled into publishing studies written by drug company ghostwriters, but falsely credited to prominent psychiatrists who are paid up to $20,000 to put their names on it. The pharmaceutical industry has set up um, companies that are educational companies, uh, and they create papers uh, that, and uh, subpoenaed evidence has found these papers where on the top it'll say author question mark, i.e. they haven't yet decided who to invite to be the author of this scientific paper. Ghostwriting is very common. As many as 50% of published psychiatric research papers are written by ghostwriters. Sometimes the psychiatrist paid to put his name on the article hardly even looked at it. Take, for example, psychiatrist Dr. David Dunner, who endorsed Paxil as lead author in a 1995 study published in the Journal of European Neuropsychopharmacology, only to later admit he had never reviewed any of the study's actual data, but signed off on the summaries instead. Even the FDA's top official for the review of psychotropic drug clinical trials, psychiatrist Dr. Thomas Lochran, has repeatedly signed his name to articles ghostwritten by drug companies that promote the use of antidepressants and antipsychotics. Psychotropics now labeled by the FDA itself as having high risks of suicidal behavior and premature death. Besides their considerable influence over FDA policymakers, drug companies exert extensive control over psychiatric journals by means of substantial advertising budgets. Every other page is a pharmaceutical ad that they pay for, and so they are the livelihood of, of the journals. That's how they get published. Medical journals are completely supported by the ads from drug companies. Without the, the ads, the journals would dwindle away. Doctors look to scientific publications as the objective source. It comes from this university, this research being done by these, you know, highly revered, very um, well-respected uh, leaders in my industry, if I can't trust them, I mean, it's doctor to doctor. I'm not listening to those sales reps. That's different. This is doctor to doctor. You know, I'm listening to the big guy. And, uh, you know, they've taken over that process. The scientific literature now, you just can't trust it. Today, between two-thirds and three-quarters of all clinical trials published in major journals are funded by drug companies. And to influence prescribers even more effectively, drug companies will give as much as a million dollars to journals for reprints of favorable trials they can later use as objective-looking marketing tools. But the pharmaceutical funding of psychiatry goes beyond even this, until years of pressure finally forced a recent promise to change. The APA's national conference was largely underwritten by drug companies, as were its government lobbying efforts. But old habits die hard. At a recent APA convention, the drug companies were there, handing out food and giving psychiatrists promotional lectures called product theaters. And they get the vast majority of their funding for their associations, for their meetings, for everything from the pharmaceutical industry. So promoting pharmaceuticals is basically the only options that they have. With 